Thank you for being part of the Oakwood Free Will Baptist Church Ministries. Our prayer is that those who listen to the Word of God will find a greater revelation of God's purpose in their lives. For additional resources, please visit us on the web at www.oakwoodfwb.com. Today, may you be encouraged, strengthened, and refreshed by our message. There are certain things that we would desire, uh, but Lord, we pray that the will of God would be done in each and every situation. Uh, Lord, we lift them up. We ask that you would uh, encourage where encouragement is needed, strengthen where strength is needed, and uh, Lord, we certainly uh, want you to be glorified in everything. And Lord, whether you heal or you don't heal, uh, you are still good. And uh, we just want to pause to recognize that today. And uh, Lord, I just pray that you bless us as we go through this class this morning, uh, that you would maybe remind us of a few things that maybe we need to be reminded of today. And uh, Lord, as it pertains to having a heart of revival, uh, Lord, that is certainly something that each of us need every day, uh, not just once or twice a year as the church has revival services, but Lord, revival ought to be in our heart continually. So God, I pray that you would be honored and glorified as we read the Word of God, as we study the Word of God this morning, and I pray you draw us to yourself, and we pray these things in your name. Amen. Amen. All right, if you have your Bibles, we're going to turn to, we're still continuing this, this theme of, uh, of enemies of revival. One of the biggest enemies of revival is ourselves. And God gave a message in 2 Chronicles chapter 7 and verse 14. Um, and this is uh, just a reminder to us of what it takes as the Lord is talking to the children of Israel, this is something that, um, that I thought was just a really good verse. And, and people use this all the time as it pertains to revival. But um, here's what the Word of God says. If my people... Now, I'm going to stop right there because there's a stipulation. In order to have revival... You've got to be the children of God. You can't revive something that hasn't been revived yet. Okay, So I said that last week. So if my people, that is, you've got to have a relationship with the Lord. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves. Now, one of the enemies of revival is pride. And I think that to a certain degree, every one of us battle with this thing of pride. I've heard somebody tell one time, well, I don't, I don't have any pride in my life. I think that that is um, deceiving yourself. Do what? I don't lie. Either. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> and so I think it's being deceptive to say there is absolutely no pride in my life because to a certain degree, every one of us have pride. Now, obviously, some, some pride... It's not wrong to be proud of a son or a daughter or to be proud of the church you're going to or to be proud of you know, a job that has been done that you did properly. Uh, there is that pride that would be not an improper pride. Okay, But to a certain degree, everyone has got a sense of pride in the fact that as you see this person down the road, you know, and they obviously are not living the way they ought to live, something kind of swells up inside of you, whether you want to admit it or not, it's like, huh, I don't do that. You know, I don't, I'm, I don't act that way. I don't do those kind of things. And in essence, what we're saying is, I'm better than that person. We may not ever come out and say it, but in our heart, that's what we're thinking. And so, uh, if we're going to have a revival in our own personal lives, not just in the church, the revival has got to start with us. It's got to start with us. So the Lord said, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, the opposite of pride is humility. And I'll be honest with you folks, people have looked at me and said, oh, Brother Dwayne, he's one of the most humble guys that there is. I, I will confess, I try to be. I really do. I try to put pride aside and I try to understand that everything that I do and everything that I am is from the Lord. And I believe that, but sometimes pride will creep in and it kind of lifts me up a little bit where I don't need to be lifted up. And so I battle with it just like anybody else does. Um, and so anyway, we've got to get rid of the pride, the improper pride, if you will, and we've got to humble ourselves before God. Uh, and then it says, and pray. 
Prayer can do anything God can do. You ever heard that? Prayer can do anything God can do. Some of you have, some of you haven't. The effectual, fervent prayer of the righteous. That's the book of James tells us. It avails much. So I know that some of us would say, well, I'm not righteous, so I don't need to be praying. No, if you're a child of God, you are considered righteous before Him. So if the the effectual, fervent prayer of the righteous avails much. So it's important that we avail ourselves of prayer because prayer will, um, will change things. Trying to write down here. There we go. All right. Um, so, number one, we humble ourselves, get rid of the pride. Number two, we pray. And then notice what he says in verse 14. And seek my face. Some people think that prayer is simply all it takes to seek, to seek the Lord's face. is just through prayer. I'm sorry, Second Chronicles chapter 7. Did I not say that? Okay, 2 Chronicles chapter 7 and verse 14. Sorry about that. Uh, So, humble yourself, pray, seek my face. So part of this thing about revival is that we are not just praying to God, but we are listening to what God has to say. You remember, I think it was last week I mentioned that as we, we communicate to God through prayer, He communicates to us through His Word and through the Spirit of God. He, the, the Lord takes the Spirit of God and convinces us of the truth of the Word of God as we read it. Have you ever read a passage of Scripture and you thought, man, I don't understand that? You ever, I read it all the time, especially the book of Revelation. Sometimes I read those verses and I'm thinking, okay, what is this saying? What is this saying? I, I'm not following it. This is, you know, uh, you know this is kind of um, speech that I don't understand. And so what I do is I will pray and I will say, Lord, this is your book. I don't understand this in your book, but you gave it to us. Help me understand what it means. Now, I use a lot of things. I use commentaries and other books and things like that, but there are times that I'll read it and I'll just think, God, what are you really trying to say? Because the truth to be known, as believers, particularly as pastors, we are to be able to rightly divide the word of truth. So I don't want to get up here and take the Word of God and take it completely out of context and say something it don't mean. So I have to pray and I have to say, God, I don't know what your Word means here. I need you through the Spirit of God to teach me what it means. But that's not just for the pastor. That's for every one of us. Because the truth be known, every man and woman of God ought to be able to rightly divide the Word of truth themselves. That is, take the Word of God in and then give it out to others the way that God intended it. So... The thing about revival, if we are going to have revival in our lives, we have got to know what it means to communicate with the God of revival. And that is our Lord and Savior. So if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, will pray and seek my face, and then he said, turn from their wicked ways. Many people today do not want to admit that they're sin. You know, we slough it off and say, well, I'm not as bad as this person or this person, and so my sin even though it may be it's not as much or bigger as big as somebody else's. And we try to shrug sin off. Sin is sin, right? It doesn't matter. You guys are on the same wavelength. You're you're exactly right. Yeah. (laughs) You're exactly right. Sin is sin. In God's eyes, it doesn't matter if it's killing somebody or if it's lying. It's sin to God. And see, we're the ones that have put degrees of sin in there. We're the ones that say, oh, this is worse than this one is. But in God's eyes, sin is in sin in general. Uh, there are some sins that have greater consequences than other sins. But it's still sin in God's eyes. So um, anyway, that's something we need to be reminded of. Uh, that we need to turn from our wicked way. Now, what keeps us from admitting our sin? Pride. Right. There you go. Seven things does the Lord hate, and the first one he mentions is a proud look, which is pride. It's just referring to pride. So, yes, pride. What else? What keeps us from turning from sin? Fear. Fear? Okay. What else? Your desire is stronger. We, we give in to the flesh rather than to the spirit. And the Bible says that the flesh is warring against the spirit. So the question is... 
do you want to be yielding to the Spirit or do you want to be yielding to the flesh? The easy route is to say, I'm going to yield to the flesh. Because there's no fight there. I mean, if you just give in to doing whatever you want to do that's fleshly, there is no, there's no battle in that. That's the easy way out. The difficult path is to do that which is right, is to stay away from sin. But what else as it pertains to sin? What is difficult? Peer pressure. Okay. Uh, you're surrounded by people who may not be godly, and so there's a, the pressure there to, again, give in and just do what feels right or feels good or whatever, not necessarily feels right, because you shouldn't, as a Christian, it shouldn't feel right to, to do wrong. But anyway, what else? Anything else? All these are great answers. Well, you mentioned fear, you know, <clears throat> fear of rejection. Okay, fear of rejection. You've got a support group that you're around all the time, that are friends, and uh, to, you know, to admit that, that, you're sin, that you've sinned and to turn from that, would there would be consequences of folks that may say, you know, hey, I don't want to be around you anymore. Uh, what else? You just simply don't care. Okay. You really, you really don't want uh, the revival in your life. Uh, well, not you don't want it. You're not willing to give up uh, those things uh, to, in order to receive it. And the Bible is very clear when it says that we are to, if we want revival, we are to turn from those wicked ways. And uh, I'm going to tell you, I have seen revival in my lifetime. I have seen it a number of times. Uh, and it's been a long time since I've seen it. I've seen true revival. I think that Oakwood has experienced it to a great degree in the fact that we've seen a lot of folks come to Christ over the last few years. Um, you know, and that, that's something that's awesome and wonderful. But again, revival is not necessarily people getting saved. We've got to remind ourselves of this. Revival is something that has already begun in our heart that needs to be stirred up again, okay? Which is our faith, our love for God. We talked about our love for God and the lack of it last week. Uh, the fact that we've lost our first love or that folks do that. So um, revival has to do with believers recognizing where they're at, recognizing where they need to be, and through the help of God getting from this point to this point. Um, and so... You know, we need revival today. When I look around us on... Now, we, last Wednesday night, we had a good crowd. Um, last Sunday night, we even had a good crowd. But when you compare a Sunday morning crowd to a Sunday night crowd, it is a vast difference. Now, uh, I will tell you this. You know, the adults that are in here, I think Sunday night, we probably, or Wednesday night, we probably had, what, 35 or so people, adults, well, downstairs we had probably 20 kids, and then over there we had probably 20 more. So we had a good crowd, but as far as adults go, you know, it, you don't see the number of adults here on Sunday nights and Wednesday nights that you do on Sunday mornings. And I'll be honest with you, I know that people got a lot of things to do, but I also know this, if priorities are where they should be, then people will have a desire to come to the house of God. People will have a desire to know the Word of God. And um, so it's important you know, that we humble ourselves, that we seek His face, we pray, seek His face, turn from wicked way, and then He said, I will hear from heaven, notice what He said, and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. So, thinking about that, that was kind of an intro back into what we're talking about. Um, when you study the book of 1 Kings... Although he said it many years ago, no one today would disagree with the great social critic and philosopher, Francis Schaeffer. By the way, if you've never read, read any of Francis Schaeffer's writings, they're very difficult sometimes to understand. But I would encourage you, read some of his writings. Francis Schaeffer, really, really good. And so he warned that we would wake up one day and find that America, the America that we once knew, is gone. I think we're there. America certainly is not where it used to, be, or you know, where we used to be. We have, in a sense, we have gotten away from God, and so um, you know we need to get back to that point. Now, some people will say, "Well, what what use is it?" Because the Bible tells us that in the you know in the last days, 
you know, there's going to be a departing from the faith. And that is true. But why in the world would God tell us, okay, I just want you to give up, not worry about this world, you know, just let it go the direction it's going to go. Don't worry about witnessing anybody. Just let it happen because it's going to happen anyway. I don't think that's what God intends for us. Because there are still people that need to be saved. There are still people that need to be reached for God. And so it's important that we understand that our country needs revival, and revival begins right here with us. If we are revived, if we're where we need to be with God, then we can kind of filter that into the world. And that's what our job is. The Bible tells us that we are to be salt, that we are to be light, and we are ambassadors for Christ. So it's very important that we understand that even though America, even though this world is not where it, it used to be, we still have hope that we can still reach people for Christ. Uh, the nation of Israel faced many crisis situations throughout history. And really, if you think about it, why was Israel in the shape that they were in back in those Bible days? It, was it God's fault that they disobeyed? Was it God's fault that they did this? or th No. It was their own disobedience that brought about uh, the crisis that they faced. Remember when they were going through the, the, the wilderness? It talks about the fact that you know, they would rebel against God and God would send judgment and then they would repent and then God would send blessing. And it was over and over and over again that that was the case. You know, and so anyway, um, it was many times we want to blame God for the situation that America is in or the situation that our world is in when, I mean, we're the ones that partly allowed it to happen. You know, we didn't stand up as, in a, as a general rule. Righteousness did not prevail as God would have it to. And as a result, um, you know, God, I believe, has sent judgment to a great degree on our country. I mean, all the natural disasters and all these things that are happening around us, I believe, is part of God's judgment on our world. And so, um, but when you look in the 18th chapter of 1 Kings, there's a story of revival even in the midst of dark days. And really, this is where the focus is. The question is this this morning. Do you believe that our world is hopeless? No. Why is it not hopeless? Because God is still here. There are still believers out there. There is still time for us to reach this world for Christ. There is still time for us to do the work of God in our world today. But Christians have got to wake up. You see, I honestly believe that God has placed each one of us where we are for a reason. I don't believe that I am here just by happenstance. I know I'm not because I am very uh, content knowing that this is where God has for me at this time in my life. And God has the same thing for you. You know, I mean, does Straw Hill live on Cooper Creek Road for no reason? No. God placed him there to be salt and to be light. And the same thing with Jimmy and Debbie and all the rest of us. You are where you are so that you can be salt and light to your community. And so if we can get, if we can understand that and settle in our mind that yes, this is what God would have us to do, to be salt and to be light, then we understand what our purpose is and we understand that if we will be that salt and light, then we can have revival come to our community. Think about, think about it like this. What if every Christian in Oakwood Church, what if every Christian in every church around our community Every person would start doing that which God intended them to do. Do you think we could have revival in our community? If we did exactly what God wanted us to do all the time, every time? Absolutely. The problem is, we let this thing about pride creep in. Well, I'm too good to do this, or I'm too good to do that, or no, I don't believe God wants me to do this. Man, I, that guy down the road, he is no good, and I know that that God doesn't want him to be saved. Now, obviously we know that's not true because God wants everybody to be saved. But I think sometimes we've already judged somebody because we think they're hopeless and they're helpless. And I'm going to tell you folks, I have seen God do it over and over and over again. Those folks that we thought would be helpless and hopeless, God has changed their lives. We've got folks that sit in here every Sunday morning that God has changed them. And years ago, people would be like, no, there's no way that person will ever be in church. But they are today because somebody cared enough about them to say, you know what, let me tell you about Jesus. And they did. And because of that, because somebody cared about them, 
enough to share Christ with them, they understood the gospel and they gave their heart to Christ. And I'll be honest with you, that's all of us. I mean, I'm glad when I was a young person, my mom and dad cared enough about me to take me to church. And I'm glad that I had a Sunday school teacher that cared enough about me to share the gospel with me. And a youth pastor cared enough about me to say, God's got a plan for your life. And I'm telling you, it doesn't matter what age you are. You know, I'm... How old am I? I'm uh, fixing to be 45, I think. If I remember correct, I was born in 71, so you do the math. I think I'll be 45 this year. All right, whether you're 45... You know, birthdays used to mean a lot more to me than they do now. I mean, it's just like, hey, it's another one gone by, you know, whatever. But whether you're 45 or you're 65 or you're 85, whatever it is, as long as you have breath, God has a place for you and God has a plan for you. And if we want to see revival come to this place, then we've got to do our part. Revival, first of all, starts in your heart and mind. So if it started in our heart and in your heart then it'll spread out to those around us. And so that's important. And, and 1 Kings has a lot to say about it. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm getting ahead of myself, so i got to back up. Um, what God has done before, God will do again. God will do it again under the same circumstances uh, if it pleases Him. I want you to abandon the notion that it is too late for revival because it's not. Um, I think that we're not willing to pay the price to have revival. We're not willing to swallow that pride. and We're not willing to, to forsake those sins. And we're not willing to do what it takes to have revival. But when you think about it like this, when you go a little bit further, um, you think about politics. And I'm not focusing on Democrats or Republicans or Independents or whatever else there is out there. Um, what I'm talking about is revival where God is revered in America again. We need revival in America. Um, and revival news anchors you know, can't explain. That is, what I mean by that is that there is such a revival that will happen around us that people will be like, I don't understand what's going on over there. Listen, when we, when, over the last couple of years, as we've seen so many folks saved, then I have had people tell me this. Man, what's happening at Oakwood? Man, this, this is the place to be. Something's happening here. People are getting saved. And people will be like, how is that happening? I don't understand that. And my answer is simply this. It is God. It is Him that's doing it. It's not me. It's not the church. It is God. If you notice what the Lord said in His Word, He said, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. God is the one building His church. We just simply need to get on board and go with God's plan. And I believe God will bless it and God will send revival. Uh, I was uh, talking with an individual it's been probably about a month ago. And that person, I was in Walmart parking lot. I didn't even know they were around. They came up, put their arm around me. There was a, a man in the community. And he said brother, which he was a brother in Christ um, and attends another church down the road. He said, brother, man, I don't know what's happening at Oakwood, but he said Man, everything, every church ought to have that kind of spirit in their church and, and have those kind of things happening. And he said, we're not seeing that. He said, all around us, churches are dying. And he said, you know, if it wasn't for this and this and this, he said, I'd be coming to Oakwood Church. And I said, look, you be faithful to your church because this is where God's placed you. And I said, we're not out to, you know, proselyte. But anyway, um, but listen, God is doing some great things. And I think sometimes we can we ha we may get to the point where we say, you know, we're we're doing pretty good here at Oakwood. Man, we're having good numbers and church is pretty full and man, we're we're doing well. And we get satisfied. And we think, oh, we have arrived. Folks, we haven't arrived. The only time we can truly say we've arrived is when we hear God say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant, enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. That's when we're going to be in heaven. Until that day comes, we got work to do. We have got a, a spirit of revival that we all want to have in our hearts and that we want to permeate throughout this church and this community. And so, what did, what did Jesus do in His earthly ministry with 12 men, 12 men? Did He not turn the world upside down for the gospel? What do you think God could do with 150 people at Oakwood Church if every person in this church would be committed to serving our Lord like they should? Man, you're talking about bringing a revival to this community. We could do it. But we've simply got to understand our purpose and our calling that God has called us to do. 
And, you know, I, there are people that have given me arguments before and said, Brother Dwayne, I'm just me. I mean, I'm nobody. And that's exactly why God can take you and use you in ways that you never thought possible. It's only when we become nobodies that God can make us somebody and use us. I mean, really. If we're, if we're somebody, God's not going to be able to use us. But if we humble ourselves and pray and seek His face and turn from our wicked way, God can use our lives. He will heal our land. He will do whatever is necessary in us and through us to make this revival happen. And my prayer is not for just our Sunday school class. I'm looking around this morning, and I want to tell you, I, see, I know God is using each of you, and I pray that God is using me, but the question is, are we willing to completely give in and say, God, man, my life is here. It, it's an empty thing. You fill it up and do, do with me what you want to do with it. I think if we had that kind of heart, man, God would be able to do much more in our lives than even that which we could even think about. Uh, I think these kids are going to practice here in just a moment, and we've got folks coming in, and I know it's...